Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Story DNA podcast. I am your co host, Kathy Close Guest. And with me, as always, is my partner in crime, Brian Carter. Hey, Brian. <laughs> and, I was muted. Hello. <laughs> there he Hello. is. There he is. I'm muted and able to talk. And uh, we have another great guest I'm really excited to introduce. We have Jonas Sachs, and he is the uh, co-founder of Free Range Studios near me in the San Francisco Bay Area, and he is the author of Winning the Story Wars. So welcome to the podcast, Jonah. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Oh, fantastic. We're so glad you, you could come. And um, I was telling Brian, I think, that you were you were off in Man, uh, Montana, which I love. It's, it's gorgeous out there, writing, or at least kind of circling in and honing in on your, your new book. So uh, uh, hope you'll tell us a little bit about that at the end of the podcast. Absolutely. So let's let's jump on in. Um, one of the things that we kind of like to do, because story, story is such a big concept, as you know, and it means so many things to different people. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit like boiling the ocean, I know. Uh, right. Jonah, how do you describe or how would you define story? What does it mean to you? Well, to me, a story is kind of a way that we humans get across ideas um, and share our values and ideas about how the world works, but not in a way by saying, hey, I've noticed this is the way the world works and you should think it too, or it's really bad to do this and it's really good to do that, or here's a new rule or law to live by, but instead we talk about something that happened, or even if it didn't happen, um, it can be fictional, between characters that we know our listener can relate to. And we see a little scene play out in their lives. It could be about ourselves or about others. And when we listen to those kind of communications, we're instantly, as listeners, making these connections and saying, oh, that could be me. Oh, if I'm that greedy, that could happen to me. Or, you know, if I follow this kind of path, and they become sort of reality simulators. So we don't have to make all the same mistakes as our ancestors made and our friends make. Rather, we can just hear stories, place ourselves in them, and say, oh, that's how the world works. And, you know, in crude, rudimentary stories, um, they used to always at the end say, and the moral of the story is, but, of course, you don't have to say that anymore. It's implied. I wouldn't tell you a story um, about how an awful, greedy, terrible person succeeded amazingly in life unless I was indicating <laughs> to you that this is an anomaly. If I told you that story, you know that I was kind of encouraging you to think that way. So um, that's what a story is to me. You know, you have to have human-scale, real characters and situations and you really let your audiences draw a lesson from that and you know because I'm in the persuasion arts I, I think about stories as tools to move people's minds mm hmm you just said something really interesting which was you know we don't have to necessarily hit people between the eyes with the moral of the story anymore um, how has storytelling evolved um, since you've been uh, a storyteller yourself and where are we now what's unique about business storytelling today is there anything special about it yeah, I mean, storytelling has evolved a lot, certainly, you know, through the broadcast era, which I, you know, which is when people would sit on a couch and get business stories, essentially advertisements, and sit there and kind of consume them uh, blindly. They would have no way of talking to their friends about what they just saw, no way to fact check what they heard. And those stories that I saw were really about um, basically, hey, you on the couch, you're kind of not good enough, not smart enough, you're kind of a loser. <laughs> and if you don't buy this product, you're going to end your life miserably. And then we see all these characters, essentially, <laughs> who we want to be like consuming the product. And we think, oh, wow, here's a story about a hero company who's going to make my life better. That is the most typical communication in business that you can imagine. You know, whether it's about the car that's going to make you hotter or about the breath mint that's going to make you finally be able to kiss somebody or anything in between. Um, the world is a scary place. You're a damsel in distress, and we're heroes who are here to save you. So that's the most typical kind of business story. Now, as consumers of information got smarter and started to touch in with each other, and also especially as they started to build um, social capital by sharing things with their, net their networks, it doesn't make their social networks feel bad and lame and uncool, but makes people feel good about themselves. We, have, we see different stories really starting to come out. We see stories from businesses not about how great the business is, but about how great the audiences can be or are through relationship to that business. It's about real individuals, not consumers, making a better life, and the brand is sort of a, a cheerleader and a helper to do that. So I think in business storytelling, we're seeing a major move to what I call empowerment marketing, which is speaking to people's highest values. You know, not saying your only goal is more convenience, more safety, cheaper prices, that your goal is to be your best self. And how can we as a business or even a social cause um, play into that? And you know, social causes are, are guilty of the same thing hamburger sellers were create guilty of, hey, the world is messed up. We're trying to save it. Hey, you stay on your couch, but give us money. We'll save it. That's not working anymore. Now it's like, how can we make you a hero in your own life? And 
So of course I think a lot about Hero's Journey and Joseph Campbell and about how ordinary people take heroic action. And I think that's the kind of storytelling you're seeing. Real storytelling where the listener is saying, hey, that could be me and that could be a great life that I could live. And that's what's spreading on social media and people want to share. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I feel like we dive, I think like we dive directly into the deep end. So can you tell me, like, give me one thing we've talked about a lot in, in this podcast is like identity, right? Mm -hmm. Story as identity. So, so yeah. tell me a story, Jonah, about who Jonas Sachs is. All right. So, I um, the story that I'm working on right now actually is kind of an interesting one um, because I'm thinking a lot about myself and my own life journey as I write my second book. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking back to um, my journey of becoming a storytelling expert. And this is a you know a story I'm sharing for the first time because I've been just starting to work it out. Um, so. Back in 2008, I started noticing that the work that I was doing, uh, viral marketing on the internet for social causes, was either amazingly successful or terrible failures, um, and I never <laughs> knew, knew how to predict which one it was going to be. And, and my clients, of course, were not paying me for terrible failures. And so I'm sitting there thinking, how can I find a pattern, right? And so I stumble upon a whole bunch of storytelling theory, and I realize that what I'm doing is not succeeding or failing because of the design or the writing or the music, but it's succeeding because it's telling a great story. And now I'm like, whoa, I'm just entering this crazy new world I know nothing about. I'm totally interested in it. I'm learning. It's connecting to my spirit. It's connecting to my intellect. And so I start giving some talks about it, you know, because I like to do public speaking. And before long, somebody offers me a book deal and says, hey, write a book about this, right? So I don't know how to do that, but I decide, yeah, this is a great opportunity. I'll write a book. And this is, you know, I'm not, I'm not being flipped here. This is really what happened. I was a total beginner and a, and a novice with, with just huge beginner's mind and so much enthusiasm. I, I go out and I try to write a book, and that book uh, made me a ton smarter, gave me a whole ton of ideas about storytelling, which is, as you said, a giant boiling boil in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And now I publish the book. Um, through an academic press, through Harvard, and suddenly I'm an expert, right? Now people are paying me to come and tell them how it works. They're paying me to know everything about storytelling, and I'm still inside, you know, a total newbie, you know, trying to master the most important human art in history. But yeah. my curiosity starts, you know, going down a little bit, and my protection of my way of thinking about storytelling, and I'm starting to map other storytelling experts about how much they agree or disagree, and I'm trying to look out at the world and prove that the world conforms to my rules, right, and say the same thing again and again. Now, I will say that the ideas that I came up with and have been selling and speaking about are totally valid. They totally work, but I have found myself becoming less of that joyful beginner and more of the locked-up expert. And um, mm -hmm. so as, as I go forward, um, I'm really trying to figure out, is the world really all about stories? Well, through one lens, yes. But maybe <laughs> through another lens, we over-narrativize things. You know, mm. Maybe through another lens, empowerment marketing is going to be overused soon, and we shouldn't be talking about it anymore. And so um, I think that in terms of being wow. a curious, open person and, and having a story that actually is worth telling by the time you get old and die, uh, you can't have your story stop at the end of one adventure. So, so I, I, you know, to be a little bit trait, yeah. you know, life and my story, ongoing adventure, and sometimes our greatest successes can be our greatest traps, you know. Well said. Yeah, yeah well said. I like that you're getting meta about storytelling and that we're, we're <laughs> you know, Brian and I have talked a lot about just evaluating our own narratives, the narratives that we tell, because... Yeah. A lot of times we buy into this narrative because we say it over and over and over again, and then sometimes you have to step back and go, well, my narratives maybe change. Is it still working? Does it serve me? And I, I, I think whether it's an individual or your business, it's the same thing. You have to step back and look and see if that narrative is still serving you. you know? Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, on the one hand, the, the cost of switching narratives is yeah. hugely expensive. I've been looking yes. actually at, at where do we see politicians, experts, uh, scientists, changing their mind and when we do we call them flip-floppers and we you know we, we yell at them but this is a sign of intelligence actually to change your story when it's no longer when it's too flat for yourself and so I do think from from psychotherapy which people are constantly needing to reinvent their stories to business where um, you know we expect we need to have a coherent brand over time we also need that space um, to evolve and to change definitely Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is just yeah. occurring to me right now, too. I don't know if you've looked at this, but it, I think when you don't have a story, people put their story on you, too. So if you aren't controlling it, someone will, like, give you a story Absolutely. and put you in the story. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that's a lot of what I do, the thinking that yeah. I do about brands, which I say, look, your brand is a story, and you're not telling mm -hmm. it anymore. It's being told across all these touch points, and it's being told by your customers, to your customers, to each other, and um, you can't control that story. But you can set the theater for it. You can set the stage and talk about what the story is going to be about and put out there the parts of the story that you know you'll be evaluated against. So I think if you think of your brand as a story and really know that stories have a moral and they have values and they have mm -hmm. carry everything that happens in the story is consistent to a way of seeing the world, um, you can cast a longitudinal story over time that customers and audiences will be excited about. But you can't mm -hmm. control it. Yeah. So, so you have an example of one of these companies that's come to you and, and an insight that you've given them turned them around somehow? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that I've sort of been most interested in over time uh, recently is this work that I've been doing for Greenpeace. Uh, I think Kathy and I spoke about it a while ago. Yeah, we did. Um, where, you know, yeah, they, they came and said, listen, um, we're 3,500 people. We're one of the most well-known brands in the world for environmental um, justice and uh, saving the world, but we know that we can't save the world by ourselves. And this whole idea of we are so brave and so crazy and give us money and we'll keep doing that is really not going to save the world in time. So what do we do? Mm -hmm. And we worked with them to go through this process of saying the only way you're going to save the world is actually inspiring every person on the planet or a billion people at least to see themselves as courageous and live courage in their own lives. Mm -hmm. And so their brand position now is shifting to a billion acts of courage. You know, not you know, one crazy stunt can change consciousness, which is kind of the old thing, but how do everything that we do not make someone say, whoa, those guys are crazy, I'm glad they're doing it for me, saying, well, if they can do that, then what can I do to make myself more courageous? And courage is something that uh, people love mm -hmm. hearing stories of courage. They love saying, uh, there was a normal person who did something courageous, and it's not a trait that's inborn, but it's something that can, end, can happen to me at any time. So there's an example where you know, the moral of the story is a billion acts of courage will create a better tomorrow, and that's been really transformative for the organization, not just in how they're communicating yeah. now, but how they see themselves, how they organize, what their theory of change is. So um, I've been really happy with, with that work and, and where it's going. It's, a re it's that real shift from consumer to yeah. participant in, with your audiences. That's huge. That, that, that actually... As, I, as you're describing it, I'm thinking about the scalability of stories and how if people don't take ownership and act on those stories, then you're stuck. And I think that was what of what you're describing reminds me of what the Obama campaign did in you know in 08 and how transformative it was because they had more uh, you know absolute numbers of donors. Now each donor had like maybe five dollars, ten dollars, fifteen dollars, but they had more donors. And I think the participatory message was. It's government is everybody's responsibility, everybody's stewardship, yeah. and and more people participated because they felt ownership in that story, and it was a really transformative campaign. It's it's a lot of like what you're describing with Greenpeace, which is not we're gonna save the world, you're gonna you're gonna save the world. This is really you. Right. And, uh, and that was a really um, that was a really counterintuitive approach in many ways because um, when people when people are in a scary situation, and 2000 you know 2008 was a scary situation. I mean, it's yeah. always a little scary when you have an election, but it's a scary situation for America. And the the dominant logic of the advertising industry is um, people are too busy, they're too overstressed. Make it easy for them. So when you're scared and you want an easy solution, uh, the last thing you want to hear someone say is, I, I can't fix this, you're going to have to do it, right? That's the assumption, and that's why you know people come up and they say, I've got a plan, and I haven't changed my mind, and I know what to do, and I'm going to do it, so vote for me and give me money. Um, and Obama came along, and of course, yes, we can, is about working harder together, but there's also quite a lot of psychological theory about why that works as well, which is, you know, I talk about in my book about Maslow, where, you know, Freud said we're only pushed by these needs to be clothed and fed and make money and be esteemed by people. And Maslow said, no, you know, we're actually, as humans, really motivated by doing things that are hard, by being part of community, by accomplishing things way beyond our expectations, even when it's not convenient and easy. Mm -hmm. So I think it touched a nerve in people and said, yeah, this is more authentic. This is not going to be easy, and it's going to take everybody. I think people were disappointed when they didn't exactly know how to plug in once the election was over. But, uh, hmm. you know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Are there business narratives out there, um, Jonah, that you're seeing that really um, strike you as, wow, they've really nailed storytelling or at least are headed really deeply in the right direction of this participatory narrative that we're talking about? Yeah, well, I, I guess first I'd like to I, I'd like to talk about one business narrative that I that I just wrote about yesterday uh, for the Guardian that I think is really interesting because of how um, where how it's kind of gone off track and how uh, interesting this moment is and, and kind of what I what I see as the opportunity here. 
Um, so, as we all probably know, uh, this whole thing with Jared Fogel and Subway has oh, been yeah. um, a mm -hmm. major problem, right? So, mm -hmm. it's a story, right? On the basis, this is a classic business storytelling. You know, Subway is not talking about the facts and the features of their sub or the prices. They're talking about an individual who turned their life around, lost 250 pounds by eating Subway, right? And um, lest anyone think that that's like a simple, easy, and, you know, M mundane example, this is considered by the restaurant industry the most effective ad um, of the last 25 years in all fast food. Jared Fogel's transformation, what it did for Subway, some people say it doubled their sales in some, by some measure, um, because they told a simple story. And of course, in, during an obesity pr crisis, what do they want people to say? Hey, that could be me, right? Yeah. That's exactly the perfect storytelling, a simple story. So then, you know, it turns out that Jared is um, not the kind of person who we want to look to as a role model, which is always, you know, which is always a risk of having true, real, real spokespeople. And part of the reason in some ways is that sometimes it's safer to tell imaginative stories than, than real stories because they can go horribly wrong. Um, but what does Subway do? You know, Subway doesn't acknowledge that for 15 years Jared built the brand. Um, now, they're let, they wanted to let go of that story. They're just saying, oh, that's not our story anymore. We haven't been working with Jared for a couple of years. We have no comment. And mm -hmm. I, I think there's an opportunity. I don't think that people are going to forget quite that easily. And what I wrote about in this piece that I published yesterday was um, how this is an opportunity to show how that story of making people's lives better and caring for people, which is really what the story was all about, is still in Subway's DNA, even if it's not in Jared's DNA, and how they could be stepping up right now. Um, Jared's going to be paying $100,000 to each of these victims. That's nothing. 14 victims of child uh, sex that they've out there. That's nothing, right? Subway could step in and make these kids' lives better. In fact, they could make all kids' lives better who are you know, victims of sexual abuse. I think that brands need to be able to respond over time when they're doing narrative branding um, to the world as it changes and recognize what's the core of that brand and then be able to you know, push it uh, forward even when things don't go the way that we expect. So I, I'm really sort of surprised that it's being swept completely under the rug. It was so weird um, to so. me. I was in the airport the other day walking yeah. through a terminal, saw all these people in line at Subway, and I just was like staring at them. I was like, "Didn't it didn't affect you? I just wanted to say to them, it did, did you, <laughs> you're still going to buy a sandwich? I mean, it didn't matter. I guess it didn't matter at all. It was uh, weird. But I mean, at the same time, yeah, well, like, I never really believed that that sandwich caused him to lose weight. So, <laughs> probably not. story. Yeah. You know, I don't know why that was a believable story in the first place. To be honest with you, but that that is a that is a deeper level of this story as well. And I, and I, I was thinking about writing about that as well, but I can't, it's like, well, you kind of reap what you sow, right? You kind of tell, you, you tell a story that questionable, and then yeah. you wind up with a questionable pitch man giving it. It's not that surprising. So I didn't quite go yeah. that far, but that is true. <laughs> you can't really lose weight by eating Subway all day long. That right. is, you know, undoubtedly true. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, but it points um, to what you're saying about that higher level narrative. If, if it is about making people's lives better, they do have that opportunity to, to redefine the story. They can still say, we're still we still believe that hasn't changed in making people's lives better. We're just going to look at it through a different lens, and it's amazing to me. You're right that yeah. they're not. I, I'm actually, I've actually been very stunned by the silence of it I all. I don't, but I don't blame them because I think if they do that, they're saying it was partly our fault that he molested those kids. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that because then it sounds like they think they're to blame. Well, and, and yeah, and that's well, where it gets complex because, you know, maybe uh, I think too many lawyers have gotten involved versus looking at through the human lens of, yeah, I want some way to respond because, you know, I, I want to know what they're going to do. Yeah. It's a tough one. I mean, it obviously has to be handled very carefully. It can't be, you yeah. know, big fanfare and balloons. If they open the new <laughs> child sexual abuse center right. um, and they're yeah. celebrating how great they are. But I do no. think that there are ways that they can actually come out and say, you know, we, we built this brand on this guy, and we still stand for those things, even if he wasn't right, and here's how we're going to, you yeah. know, anyway, that's a yeah. thought. Um, so that's to answer your question a little bit more directly, <laughs> not with a cautionary tale, you know, I, I've been really interested uh, to see how, you know, quickly growing businesses um, that change quickly over time as well can find that real values base and emotional core that can hold together like a very multi-touch point business. And so I, I've been interested in how Airbnb, for instance, has really managed their brand over time. And, you know, because it's, it's very important that they have a brand story that, um, that uh, doesn't just get people to want to sign up and buy, 
but that gets people to want to behave a certain way in all of these experiences mm-hmm. with each other, you know, disintermediated by the brand. And so, you know, Airbnb went along for a while as part of the sharing economy thing, but they were kind of thought leaders, but they weren't really doing anything with their branding. And then they came out with this belong anywhere story where, you know, the whole thing is like people are good and the world is open to you because there are people everywhere who want to embrace you. And um, they tell stories in their marketing and the whole experience is really about pro-social behavior and how to get more of it in the world. And so people love going to Airbnbs um, because of that interaction with other human beings. And the brand serves as a kind of like a, a North Star for how we can behave with each other. Now, of course, they have all kinds of problems to manage and issue all, uh, issues to manage all the time, including their own pro-social behavior. But um, I think this is an example of where if you try to manage a community uh, and you don't have ra- values and you don't talk about those values, you don't tell stories about who holds those values to the highest um, you do miss an opportunity to uh, to grow and to and to continue to succeed, succeed. So I think their whole rebrand has been a very interesting story. Yeah, that's been the one that Brian and I in our discussions with everybody, everybody points to Airbnb. I think it's it's just a recent example of where they really nailed that top level story. Uh, because so much of when we talk about story, people want to get into the tactical campaigns, and it's very disassociated mm-hmm. and separate from looking at the overarching company story and going, yeah, they nailed it. And now, when you look at Airbnb, because they're so clear about what they stand for and the value they bring, it's no wonder that they're, the way that they're implementing content strategy makes sense, because they have a very compelling, overarching, big story. To hang yeah. to, that everything yeah. fits under, you know. Yeah, and they had to kind of answer the question. It's like, what is this weird thing where you can go to other people's places? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, why would you do that? Well, it's on there, you know. And they had to answer that question. That was, that's genius. It's a generation yeah, yeah. too, I think. You know, yeah. I'm trying to think about my, uh, you know, my my mom, and, and it's funny because, uh, <laughs> you know, I, we saw that commercial and I explained to her what Airbnb was, and you know, coming from her generation, she's like, Mm-mm, no, <laughs> <laughs> you know, fear of strangers and trust and all those different things, and I think it is a generational shift. Millennials, Gen Y, look at trust and 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 adventure and being open in a very very different way. You know, so it is the right message yeah. for the right time. I think. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Any other any other things? I'm just curious. Any other brands come to mind? Is anything in the B2B space that you've seen, Jonah? I'm trying to think about what I've been observing recently. I've been deeply involved in studying cognition recently, and I haven't kept my eyes out on on brand new uh, brand storytelling. So if, I don't know if you're gonna edit this, but if you want to give me a minute, I can think about it. <laughs> Um, yeah, we'll, we'll come yeah, back to uh, it. I know it's, it's hard to do yeah, on the fly, which I think is also, Brian yeah. and I also have discussed, we think maybe that's also a reflection of the fact that, there, sadly, there's not a whole lot of B2B brands out there that people can name that are like, yeah, they're really doing a great job storytelling. So it's an opportunity for B2B yeah. to maybe step up a little. <laughs> it's a very, I mean, you know, and it, is, it is a lot harder, you know, just in writing the book. When you look yeah. at B2C uh, marketing, it's just if you're immersed in it, you can't stop seeing it. With B2B, you, you, know, you have to really search it out. Uh, less money is involved in the actual, you know, more sort of large-scale uh, attempts. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a tricky a tricky piece. You know, I, I've been, one, one of the projects that I've been working on that I think is interesting in the B2B space um, is with Microsoft and what they've been going through. You know, they really had a very big, monolithic, genius kind of brand. Like, they were, were the geniuses, top-down kind of brand. They dominated the world. They got knocked back pretty pretty. Uh, severely to having to really, you know, fight again for their space. Mm. And, um, you know, they came out with this new idea, which is that, you know, their goal in the world is not to dominate it and make everyone use their product, but their goal in the world is to power everyone, to empower everyone to achieve more through technology. That was their, that was their new idea of what they wanted to do. And so they've actually hired us over time to, um, you know, we're in the middle of a bunch of projects to go out and talk about how um, people are making the world, real case studies about how customers of theirs, not consumer customers, but business customers, are innovating completely new ways to live and make the world better using these, you know, relatively uh, advanced but somewhat passive tools that Microsoft offers. So they're really investing in this um, in this idea that you cannot sell these expensive solutions to customers by simply listing how much better they work. That you have to sell them as in, we are joining a movement of change makers who see things differently and Microsoft is there to make our dreams come true. Um, and so mm-hmm. I think that the, the work that we've been doing with them 
uh, they've really been been pushing and we've been really helping them figure out how do you go deeper and deeper into the emotional side of this into understanding what is motivating people to to win in these spaces that go beyond just profit or something like that um, and how uh, you can get business audiences to realize that I'm just not a, I'm not just a, a worker in this transaction but I'm a human being and that's why I want to buy this product um, mm. so it's been pretty interesting yeah mm. What you're, what you're saying reminds me a lot of what Intel's been doing lately, and and I don't know if you if you either of you seen seen that. It's really interesting because you know about a year and a half ago they really started to make a change in the way that their brand was was out there talking in social media, and they have um, done some really interesting campaigns and stories around unlock your genius, and they feature geniuses mm -hmm. and really smart people using their technology to, to do some really interesting thing like that 15 year old uh, who who um, was a, uh, a TED team uh, speaker and I'm, the name escapes me but he basically um, thinks he isolated a gene that was uh, you know responsible for cancer I mean this is a 15 year old kid and they featured him and a lot of the work he did was using you know uh, the, the systems used in Intel processor and you know it was just really interesting to highlight these stories yeah. Through the lens of the, the smart people, and they own that nerd market. Yeah. And they're like, "Hey, look, our audience is nerdy, and that's a good thing. And we're proud of it, mm -hmm. and they're proud of it. And embrace your inner nerd." <laughs> that's true. Yeah, and you know what? It's funny because I think stories like that uh, they kind of need to end in a way with the embrace your inner nerd. It has to be a little bit. You can get into this place where if you're if your spokespeople are always superheroes. Um, people can look at that and say, "Oh, well, that's pretty cool," but you know. But then you feel a little bit less empowered to do something because you're like, "Well, I'm not that. I, I didn't do anything at 15." Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> right. and so exactly. You wanna, you wanna, you want people to see these stories and say, "Hey, these are my kind of people. Not uh, these people serve the geniuses of the world." Only, exactly. You know, and so exactly. Um, and they, exactly. You know, and they, and they, mean, they don't mean literal genius, but yeah, you're right. No, and they've they've got women in there, and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a constant push and pull though with with, with yeah. marketing and branding all the time. It's like, are you showing are the characters in your stories aspirational, or are the characters in your stories, um, you know, too beyond aspirational so that people right. feel alienated? And and there's a lot of kind mm -hmm. of cognitive research on that. There's an idea that I've been researching for my new book about uh, called minimally counterintuitive concepts, which is that people find situation stories especially find situations and characters. Um, that are weird and different and don't conform to have what to their expectations to be the thing that they remember the most and they're the most interested in. But if it's too far outside of um, our expectations, we don't really know what the category to put it in and we, we forget about it. You know, a lot about how, sort of how, how religion is based on that. Like, Jesus is a man who came back to life. That's like counterintuitive, but we can still grasp it, right? Um, and so it's easier to latch onto that than like the Big Bang, which people have a lot of trouble, you know, with any intuition around. Um, so I think that the, that's just a tip that I have for storytelling in general is, you know, you have to have these stories that break people's expectations. That's where memory and interest in stories come from, um, where it's like if you have a story about the guy who's rich and powerful and great at the beginning and at the end he does something rich and, power, and he's rich and powerful and great at the end and he did something you expect of him, that's a typical marketing is basically like that. Yeah. How does the person least likely to succeed come through? How does someone who was so successful fall apart? These are things that, oh, I didn't expect that. That's where people like perk up and look. And yeah, that's a great and that's a really great point because you know definitely like going back to the sort of the intel thing. Yeah, if it's too outside the norm, people go, God, well, I'm not a 15 year old genius, so I can't. Put, I, I think at 15, I mean, mm -hmm. I know I wasn't curing cancer and coming up, <laughs> I wasn't doing any of those things. And you know, it, it mm -hmm. is. But I think there is something about um, being able to to say to audiences like we know who our audience is, and we know that the audience, if if it's if it's nerds or if it's women or whatever it is, embrace that, make it a great thing, and make people feel like. Uh, to your point, that it is empowered, empowering, and maybe the person who's who's least likely to succeed uh, doesn't become a superhero because that's just too perfect a bow of an ending. But maybe they surprised yeah. themselves and did something that they didn't think they could do. Now that's achievable, yeah. and then and then you look at that and go, that's realistic. I could, I, that's me. I might be able to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, I think also you know we often put stories. Uh, brand and marketing stories into this idea of well how do we make people feel the emotion that we're going for is sort of like uh, often uplift and you know, if it's not if it's not fear it's, it, it becomes sort of like uplift and uh, renewed sense of purpose which is like good emotions but most stories um, go way beyond like a really good story go way beyond that as you guys know like 
it should be funny, right? Like that, a good story is is hilarious, or a good story makes you yeah. a little bit afraid, or a good story um, gets you into a, into a state of discomfort. And I think that brands mm -hmm. are still really struggling to do that well. You know, we've got brands that are funny, but they're like um, they're like nihilistically funny, or they're just stupid funny, and which we like, yeah. we pass it around, but it's not a great connection to the brand. Um, very rarely do you find a complex brand story where you're like, I laughed, I cried. I couldn't forget it. And that's where I think, you know, there's just still so much space to, to learn. Yeah, they either don't have the, ta the creative talents, the, with the people with the experience to do that kind of thing, or they, we've talked about this before, the, they maybe aren't comfortable with the risk that's involved. Yeah. With mm. that level yeah. Of, of story. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's interesting, you, you, to Brian's point, you know, we, we've talked to some folks and, and they have uh, pointed out the issue of things like conflict even, and you need it for a story, but how some brands are very uh, risk averse or conflict averse and they don't want to, they avoid it. And so what ends up happening mm -hmm. is, I think to your point, is it, it really dilutes the potency of any story they're going to tell because it's like, well, so what? And um, are, are you seeing, Jonah, in, in the work that you do, are there things that business storytelling is is dancing around where if they just went there and did it they would they would do better is it is it the conflict issue is it the protagonist issue where where do people or brands I should say where do, where are they getting lost in this business storytelling thing um, I have a couple I have a couple of responses to the conflict question on the one hand I think uh, businesses often see conflict in terms of competition with other businesses mm -hmm. right other products yeah. and and that's like funny, but generally comparison advertising is has a limited value. It's it's yeah. okay for certain situations, but it, it is limited. Um, what what good brands that are relevant are actually the conflict they're actually in is between broken ways of thinking and doing things, which can be embodied in bad guys and people, and new better ways of doing things or return to a traditional thing that was better. So when you think about like what's our conflict, it's not like we're, we're better than Apple or we're better than Samsung, and the conflict is not like uh, we're better than phones that don't work, but you know, are we, can we think of ways in which we are changing the way the world works, and the bad guys are the people who are stuck in the old way, or stuck <laughs> in the broke way. Um, yeah. I call that I call that actually cheat in my book, which means that we've always told stories about people who break the rule. In the old days, we 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 tell stories about people who break the rules and got punished, because that's how tribes could remain together and cooperate. Now we like to tell stories where people break the rules and they're rebels. They break through. So if you yeah. can really tell those like great rebel stories and have guys that are you know they're blowing up the bat the old way of doing it, like the classic <laughs> 1984 Apple 1984 yeah. ad is like a very very you know straight up example of that. Um, people love that stuff, you know, um, and so. I think that wasn't just because the 1984 ad wasn't just about how bad IBM was as a business. It was about the old way of thinking about computers being replaced by a new way of thinking. It wasn't about the company. It was about the new way of thinking about computers. Um, so I think in conflict, like, yes, you really do want to have uh, bad guys that you can root against, and you want to have people rebelling against ways that don't work and um, create some you know, moral investment in the story without conflict there isn't really a story. In the, in the more, like, bigger issue about conflict and brands, um, I, I, I wrote uh, a piece at the beginning of this year saying that I thought that this year would be the year of the pro-social brand in which brands mm -hmm. come out and take personal stands on political issues. Um, you know, I think I was, well, if you look for evidence of anything, you're going to find it, right? But <laughs> I did find yeah. quite, a, quite, a, quite a lot of that starting to happen. You know, you see, like, um, uh, you saw um, Salesforce doing that uh, Indiana uh, gay rights video, and like you know, it's pretty ballsy and edgy um, yeah. when that whole Indiana case came down. Um, but that was a big viral success for them, and took a company that basically doesn't have much of a story except that they make sales products and built a tribe around themselves, and you know, got that kind of uplift. You know, we see brands now much more talking about, willing to talk about climate change, willing to talk about women's issues. Um, so I think that there's a huge that's conflict, that's societal conflict because not everyone's going to be on board with what you have to say. But I think that brands that take a stand actually uh, really can gain much more fanatical users and have reasons for people to talk about them. And like, if business is going to have such a big place in society, which it does for better or worse, they might as well be doing things that you know make society better. It's actually interesting that you mentioned Salesforce because um, you've, uh, if you've been to, to Dreamforce or you know uh, some of these these huge yeah. huge you know conferences, you know Dreamforce. And now that I think about it, I couldn't think about it. It didn't occur to me when we were talking about B two B. They do a really interesting job because their stories are really never about them. It's always been about their customers and what their customers are using Salesforce for. 
And it's, mm -hmm. so it's never been a self-narrative, which is really interesting. Their biggest narrative is go ask our customers. And they'll tell all the stories at Dreamforce. They'll have their biggest customers tell their stories about, you know, and the data center went down because of the flood, and then here's what happened. And they have these narratives, but they're all based on their customers. Yeah. And when I think about it, you're absolutely right about you know some of the issues because they've had a lot of women speakers, which in you know, a lot of tech conferences, you know maybe it's my gender filter. I don't mm -hmm. see a lot of women speakers. Not so with Dreamforce. They had a lot of really strong women speaking, and they made it very clear that you know uh, um, women customers and women's rights in the workplace are very important to their brand. So they come at yeah. their stories very interestingly. They never you never hear them talk about well we this we that, and that's what's that really a interesting. Was that phrase yours? Go ask our customers. So that's their phrase. Um, you know, I think it's that's my interpretation of it. My, that's my interpretation. Uh -huh. It's I've not seen them say that, but in so many words, uh -huh. that's basically what they say. Because if you ask about their yeah. narrative, they right. don't have a big narrative. Um, they really right. don't. And yeah. it's just I, funny because you know, I was gonna say like in B two B selling, you know, obviously there's quite a bit of like you know customer stories. We tell customer stories. Yeah. This is important. Um, but I love the, uh, I just love what you said about go out customers being the sort of tagline, right, for a real a great B2B customer. I mean, that, I mean, a great, great B2B company, that's mm -hmm. what they should be saying, like, not just telling those stories, but that's, it's not quite the moral of the story, but that's almost like right. a wrap up. It's like, I'm telling you this because basically anything you want to know, go ask your customers, yeah. is a very uh, validating position for, for a B2B brand. Right? Take so much to actually try, trademark they, that. And, they should. No, it's not, <laughs> it's not being used. I just Googled it. No, that's my <laughs> interpretation of, of what you get at the conference, which I I think is more powerful actually and that's what's really fascinating about it because it's probably stronger than anything that they could do that was self-referential I think um, yeah it's, yeah I, I and I, I, totally, I totally agree I think but but I'm, I'm also in that what makes it even more powerful and special is if you can hold it all together under a, a big storytelling strategy you, you know do. or, or let, yeah. the, and let the audience know and that's yeah. so that's something like go ask our customers you should call them up and pitch them on it yeah, well, you know what? Hey, Salesforce, you see this? Call us. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Brian, you look like I, you had a question. No? <laughs> oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Is, is there anything that you think, um, Jonah, on the, on the horizon of storytelling? And since you're, you, know, you wrote that book and you've, you've talked about this you know, hundreds of times, what do you think's next for, for business storytelling? Where does where does you know business storytelling you know three point oh four point oh whatever where does it take us? Yeah, um, I think that there's going to be um, you know a lot of times in in retrospect about great businesses we we find out as a public like what was happening inside and what principles were guiding them and like what were their design principles and what were they trying to do in the world and we find out much later you know Steve Jobs is genius etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's a real opportunity and it is kind of the flip side in a way of that customer storytelling there's a real opportunity for brands to let people in um, and tell stories about the innovation process and the principles that guide them and how they as a company actually create as a way for people to understand what is the story of the thing that they're, they're holding or the thing that they're involved with. And it's sort of like um, radical transparency. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for people to get inside because people, you know, they do love brands and they want to know what's really happening within those companies that sort of run their lives in some ways. And so I, I, don't, I haven't seen an, enough great work uh, to let people and customers really be part of, almost feel like they're employees of these companies um, mm -hmm. and that they're part of the team. And so I, I think that there's going to be a lot more of that opportunity out there. Um, you know, I think that I meet with people all the time who talk about um, and pitch me on nonlinear storytelling, interactive storytelling, um, and how that can relate to brands. And it's amazing how... Um, you know how rudimentary it still really is. You know there are YouTube videos where you can tap a button to change your point of view a little bit, and they're kind of neat in their own way. But um, I, I, my gut instinct and my intuition is always like, you know what? We have a short amount of time to communicate with people. We want them to understand the story, and people have loved to listen to stories for millennia. It's going to be hard to do this nonlinear thing. And then I know that you should never say never. So I don't know how to predict where that's going to go. But the more kind of game-like experiences of storytelling from brands, I think, is inevitable. But I don't think there's any credible direction on, on where that's going right now. And then the last thing I say is that I think that um, because 
young people are in charge of big brands now and there's all kinds of disruption mm -hmm. in the space. I do think the kind of stories that we were talking about, um, about um, you know, conflict and true humor and edginess and all that kind of stuff, you're like, whoa, this is so ballsy for a brand to tell a story like this. I think they're going to start happening and then people are going to do a big amount of me too on that kind of stuff. So we see a little bit of it. I think we'll see a lot more. But as I said, um, I'm trying to be more of a... Uh, a beginner than an expert on things in, in the, about the future, so uh, I wouldn't say that any of those things will come true. <laughs> Beginner's good. It's it, it's it's the joy that you talked about. Um, that, yeah. uh, a question that uh, another question that might be big, but I'm I'm just you know thinking about your kind of top level thoughts is you know Brian and I and some of our guests we've you know we've talked about this concept of return on story and how and 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 not not the technical campaign level because you can you can you know you can measure those um, really more. If you are Airbnb and you, you do something really ballsy and new in the world and you change that big overarching story, how do you know at that big level that, the, you know, the big story, that big story, your, your brand story, how do you know they're working and, and how do you think about that when you think about return on story or how are customers that you're talking to thinking about that? I mean, I think the first way that it, that it starts is um, and the easiest way to measure, and in some ways the most important, is uh, internal. You know, if you are telling a bold story to the world, and it can only happen when you're externally telling the story. It doesn't happen when you've got it on like a document on your internet. But if you're out there telling that story every single day, um, your employees and the people on the team um, are going to know that you need to live that story out. And if decisions are being made that are consistent with the story and um, that you're trying to tell, if you are able to make decisions more easily and bring your teams along, if innovation is happening faster because you have certain kind of core principles that you like to work by, um, that are all part of your story, if you're bringing, you know, employee retention, recruiting, all these things should go up if you have a coherent and compelling narrative, and you can measure that immediately. Um, and so I think we see that again and again, especially a lot of studies of millennials. Now they want to be part of something, and that mm -hmm. something is a story. It's not like they want to be in a workspace that has a lot of light or good food in the cafeteria. They want to be part of some meaning, and that comes from a story. So I'd say at the beginning, you know, if your team doesn't understand the story, your story is not working. And that the return is very tangible when your team is innovating and working together in a much better way. And that only comes from telling the external story. Um, you know, yeah. otherwise, how else do you measure, you know, your return on story, I would say, you know, it's not that different than measure the traditional measures of brand loyalty. Um, but you want to see sort of like it with a good story when you have when your brand loyalty is growing, which you can measure in big, you know, uh, studies of thousands of consumers, or you can measure by return customers. Um, you want to be talking to those top customers and asking them, you know, what is it about the experience and the relationship with you that they most appreciate? And brands with good stories. Um, they'll keep hearing those stories back from their customers, mm -hmm. not just, I love your product, I love your offering, but I get your story, I want to be part of what you're in. And what will happen is they'll start sharing those, you know, sharing those stories naturally with you. There are some brands um, that put out a call for user-generated content, uh, show us your Harley-Davidson experience, for instance, and they get flooded. And other brands that put it out, and people, they're people, well, I don't even know what you're talking about. I like your product, but I don't have any <laughs> story with you. So I think when your audiences are like eager to share their own stories, you know that your story is getting through, um, and in a kind of brand loyalty way. So yeah. I, I think it's more tangible than than I think it's easier to measure in a sense if you set your metrics along these types of lines. And um, you know, I I think that from the very beginning of Mad the golden age of Madison Avenue, there's been an understanding that you have to create an aura um, and a, a sense making and meaning around your brand, and that pays off. Um, and you know we have tools to measure it, but we can think about stories as really um, no longer just brand in a single touch point from a, in a broadcast way, but across all touch points. Mm -hmm. Well said. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, I'm, but I'm sure a story a story telling people we're always going to be having to justify it every time. Oh, I I'm going to. Uh, Absolutely. I'm going. I'm going to a board meeting on Monday um, with a client. The entire communications team this is a nonprofit. Uh, entire communications team, totally happy, totally excited about the story. They're using it. The story is not, you know, a document. It's led to the the new logo, the new website, the new content strategy. Everyone's happy. And you know, and I'm getting uh, an, an email today saying we do have a few board members who want to know what our return on investment has been so far. And like they just <laughs> launched it last week. You know. 
and how we plan to measure. And they haven't hired us to do a fundraising strategy or marketing strategy either. And um, you know, luckily the client's like, I know, I know, but let's at least talk about what you're going to say. And you know, that's going to be our, that's going to be, you know, there's still people out there who say people buy just on products and fe uh, you know features and facts, and like, you're going to have to live with those people sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I think there's fewer and fewer of those, and it's really interesting to see because that mentality is, uh, that mentality is changing. But uh, it really is, I think, also a generational thing too. It's really interesting to me. So, I think you're on to something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Brian, did you have any questions before we before we uh, talk about uh, his new book, or if you want to? No, talk I want about to hear book? about it. Let's hear yeah, about the new book. We want to hear about what you're working on. If you want to share just even a little snippet there, Jonah, of what the next book's gonna be about. Yeah, um, I'm gonna save the title for myself. Uh, mm -hmm. Just I don't want anybody else writing this book, but um, <laughs> but I'll give you some of some of the things that I'm thinking about. Maybe I'll throw some red herrings in there to throw off my competitors so that they go and write those things. But um, you know, the things that I've been thinking about lately are really about counterintuitive counterintuitive creativity. So yeah. the um, set of ideas and assumptions and values and beliefs that we bring into any new business situation. Uh, innovation, making our teams work better, launching a new product, creating marketing, um, they serve us really well because they're the sum of our experiences and we le we've learned over time how to embrace them uh, and we can create rules that make it much faster to get to a solution and yet we all, um, my assumption is, that we all are stuck in certain places of mediocrity in our lives. Um, not, you know, not across the board, maybe some of us are, but most of us feel like we're, we're getting somewhere, but there's some things we keep trying and keep failing, right? And how do you change that? Now you can pick up a book on um, design thinking, or a book on brainstorming, or a book on play, a um, book on storytelling, and try some new tools out. But my belief is that um, if you don't challenge some of those most core assumptions and beliefs within yourself that you think probably make you you and are not safe to, uh, to challenge, you're going to keep getting the same result. And so how without opening up the field of possibility so you're totally lost and totally pliable um, and you know, lose all sense of where you're going, how do you really identify places where your palette of thinking is too small? Um, so one of those is, you know, there's a lot of books written out, out there about how often experts are wrong, and you know, they're funny books, and you can laugh at the experts. But there's no books really about how your own expertise creates traps uh, where you're like, I right, well, I'm, we're going to skip over all that because I already know that I wrote the book on that, or you know, I'm, I got, got to be a manager because I knew that I can't ask that again. Um, so you know, questions like that, questions of cheating. So you know, yeah. uh, a lot of innovation is actually people who are breaking the rules, and yet we want to bring a sort of moral framework to everything we do, and we, we want to stop people from like you know flash trading to ruin the stock market, and uh, you know, and doping mm -hmm. in baseball. But the best innovations really have come from people who are willing to sort of cheat a little bit. So I'm playing with ideas like that, uh, talking to you know, trying to trying to figure out what the latest in some neurobiology and psychology is, but also talk to people who are willing to. Um, to think in ways that make them uncomfortable and talk about how to change their lives um, and tell those stories. And so hopefully it's going to be a little bit like my last book, which I, which I try to make a, a bit of a personal journey as well as a skill building journey. Um, you know, I hope people will connect up with it on a very personal level and try to grasp the, the fact that you know, the world really is counterintuitive and these ideas, you know, the, you, reality works in counterintuitive ways and this idea that we've got most of it figured out, we just need to change one thing to get better, um, I think gets us into traps. So just yeah. playing with ideas right now, but yeah. I'm going. Interesting. Yeah, I, it's, it's, uh, we chatted a little bit about that before, uh, you know, I, I think it's a completely a great book for the right time, because we never, or seldom, seldom do we ever go back and look at the assumptions we've made and revisit them and say, was I wrong here? Could I, could I have missed something? Mm -hmm. We just don't. We just assume mm -hmm. that we already know it. And sometimes, you know what, we're wrong. <laughs> so, your book yeah. sounds I mean, a lot of yeah, a lot of. I mean, if you look at if you look at um, you know behavioral uh, behavioral economics, um, we see that we're almost always wrong in almost every decision we make. So like, there's lots of room for for improvement. If we, what I, what if, I wonder is that's, that's more awful, so. yeah. Is there like a fatigue? Like, because I know a lot of times I'll get an energy to do something because it's new, right? So when you're thinking about an area that you think you already know, is part of the problem there that you feel like you don't have any energy for it anymore? Mm. Yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of creativity research on novelty and how much novelty sparks energy and new yeah. ideas. And I think that yeah. that's true. Is like you start to surround yourself with other storytelling experts or comedy experts or whatever. You start to you start to talk to the same people. You think the same thoughts, and yeah, yeah you get tired of hearing yourself speak. Uh, when you've just learned something new, it's interesting. It's interesting dynamic. If if I've just learned something new 
and I'm not really sure what I've learned, but I want to share it with you. It's a kind of like rollicking, interesting conversation where I don't have a lot of ego involved. Maybe I'm not explaining it right. Maybe I am. I'm going to listen to what you say, and we're going to have an awesome conversation. But even in doing some of the expert interviews for my book, I, I realize, you know, I'm talking to some people when, you know, talking to psychologists, talking to artificial intelligence experts, talking to economists, and sometimes you pick up the phone and you're like, this guy is just saying what he said to the last 40 people who called him, mm -hmm. and this is his job to say that thing, and he is bored out of his mind, and you know, no matter what I ask him, he's going to say the same thing. And he had a good idea 35 years ago, but like, you know, it's only one idea. Um, and so sometimes you can really feel that someone, the, the joy is not necessarily there, and they're very caught up in the defending their idea versus other people's ideas. Um, and what I always you know, think is, look, it was awesome to, for me to write a book about storytelling, but, but uh, you know, a well-rounded person uses storytelling and 15 other tools to approach a problem. I can't use storytelling to approach a problem, right? And um, no matter how much it might be comfortable, they just keep using that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's making me a better person, I hope, uh, reading it. Or maybe it's just going to make me totally confused, but I'm hoping it's going <laughs> to open, open my mind, and uh, that's part of writing a book. Yeah. I, had a, I had a question for you guys about this. Um, you know, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about thoughts and ideas that make us uncomfortable. Um, for, and, and, you know, one of the reasons we get uncomfortable with new ideas is because it just takes longer to get through them than things we can rush through, the highways mm. of cognition that we zooming down. But another reason that we get uncomfortable is because we think we might get rejected. We think we might push it too far. We think we might be wrong. And it, it, it's my understanding that, you know, for comedians and stand-up comedy, if you're not making people uncomfortable and yourself uncomfortable, there's a kind of flatness to it. And that there's a, this discomfort is really where uh, good things happen. And if you, you know, you don't necessarily even want to love the comedian or even know if you'd want to be alone with that comedian sometimes to make, to think that they're just so interesting and hilarious. And I'm just wondering what you guys think about, like, um, risk as it, risk and discomfort as it relates to comedy. Wow. Yeah, it's a big one, huh? You go first, Kathy. You're the <laughs> shit disturber. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it's interesting because my journey is a whole journey in itself and it's, you know, from sketch and improv to stand up and back and, you know, I think it's very easy to get trapped in the safe stuff but when I have really pushed myself and said to myself, can I or should I say that? Should And, I, and I'll self-censor. <laughs> And then I'll, I'll think, you know what, no, there's no other way to go out there and know if it's going to work than to just do it. And mm -hmm. sometimes on a stage it falls flat, but I'm always amazed at sometimes what's in my head, if I work out the joke right, it, it lands and people are laughing. And, and it's like, okay, so there's something to this, so I just need to dig deeper. This is where people laughed. i got to take that idea and, and go deeper. And mm -hmm. I'm always amazed that... Um, the ones that I've said to myself, should I, can I, dare I, <laughs> those are the ones that people laugh the hardest at. And I think it's made me a believer personally that if my comedy doesn't take any risks, I'm just doing the same crap everybody else is doing and there's no difference. I'm not, I'm not pushing it. Yeah, that's great. All right, so here's my response. <laughs> when you're new you're defenseless against the audience, okay? And the language of comedy mm -hmm. is that you either die or you kill. And when mm -hmm. you build up a series of jokes that work reliably, you have an immune system against the audience. And so at the same time that there is this inner reward for coming up with a joke you love, which may or may not, the audience may or may not laugh at, which yeah. is tragic, mm -hmm. um... And when they do laugh at it, and especially when you find, oh, this is one that works with every audience, that's awesome. And, and there's a great feeling to that, too. Um, you still have, you still love the jokes that always work. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. they make you feel accepted by the audience. They make the performance okay, etc. So it's not like, I mean, they don't lose all their value just because there's no more risk anymore. Um, and there's... It's almost like a surf, like a surfer. Does a surfer feel bad because they got on top of the wave again? No, they're still riding. They're still mm -hmm. surfing. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I think there's an inherent joy to doing it still, um, even though. But yeah, and and honestly, 
Im- improv is crazy. Like, I haven't had enough yeah. guts to be, like, the stand-up guy that writes on stage, which a lot of stand-ups do, and it's more yeah. and more popular these days. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll write at home and then bring it out and prove, and I'm like, I've, I've proven I can do what Seinfeld did, was write it at home and bring it out and prove that I can get you to laugh. Yeah. But but improv yeah. is a lot, is very, is crazy, because you don't necessarily know what you did or why they laughed or or anything. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's yeah. fun. It is, it is fun. It's without a net. It's something that you mentioned about risk. It, the value definitely doesn't go away. And, I, and I, I, I love knowing that I can go in and tell a bunch of jokes and I already know that they're going to kill because I've tested them over and over again. But what I have found mm-hmm. myself, I have found that my boredom level, um, the audience may laugh, but then I get restless and I think I'm falling on the same right. material over and over again. And then yeah. I disappoint myself because, uh, you know, that's me going, I am playing it safe here. And so what right. I, I, you know, it's, I, you know, without name dropping, there's a, there's a Bay Area comedian who's a political satirist who's a very well-known satirist, and he saw me do stand-up at Reister's, and he pulled me aside after the third time he saw me, and he said, you're funny, but I've seen you three times in a row and you've had the exact same set. Where's your new stuff? Ouch. <laughs> well, it was ouch, but I'll tell you what. I thanked him for saying that to me because he was right. Yeah. There is something right. about playing it safe to the point where I don't even have to look at my set list and I just go in and I do my set. That's not really serving me and my growth. So what I actually, yeah. he kicked my butt and I was grateful that he took the time to actually say that to me because he could have just not said anything to me. So what I strive for personally is I try to st- strive most nights that I'm doing stand-up uh, for 50% new material and 50% mm-hmm. old material. So I start with the old material and I build up the laughs per minute. And then when I'm yeah. feeling okay, the audience is with me, then I start pulling out the stuff that I haven't tried before. And um, that that yeah. actually shook my world, and I was grateful for him to tell me that. Yeah, and I mean, and what you guys are saying, like, totally makes sense in terms of this, you know, idea that it's not, it, it's... Uh, to break what you you can have intuitive rules that get in the way all different ways and cognitive flexibility is what's really important. Yeah. So it's not like you should never tell an old joke. That's right. a stupid rule. Right. It's That's a stupid a, yeah. rule to say never tell a new joke. Like, it, it is that how do you find the patterns that actually work for you and stick yeah. with them until they stop working? And then yeah. also how do you break the ones that aren't? But there's an, there's another question which and I'm, we're kind of running out of time, but I just that's one more which is um you know what about the jokes that make you know, these are jokes, new jokes that make you feel, feel, feel uncomfortable because you're not sure if they're going to work. But a lot of yeah. jokes that really work make the audience feel uncomfortable. And it's such a fine line between making them angry and <laughs> sad or something and making them feel like called out for being human and, oh, my God, isn't this funny? And so like, what about that? Like, you know, you want to be liked and you, they pay to see you, but you also want to push them. And, and how does that work? Mm. It depends on what to me, it depends on what you're doing, you know, because I don't do pure stand up. I I'm a keynote speaker, so I speak for business mm-hmm. audiences, and there are stand up jokes I have that I cannot use for yeah. a business audience. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And if I pull those out in a stand up environment, yeah, I love some of them are a little dark, some of them are a little like punch in the face to the audience or whatever, and and those are fun and and so I like I kind of like some of them because I'm not allowed to use them that often. <laughs> um, but but that depends on the on the the comedian yeah. and their upbringing. I was grown. I grew up in the suburbs, and I'm pretty functional, <laughs> like Brian Regan or Jim Gaffigan. And then there are, there are audience people that like that kind of comedy, right? But then you've got Dave Attell, or you've got people who grew up. They're a little bit more messed up. They had a messed up childhood. Right. They're not as functional. Yeah. They're then they attract an audience that's not as functional. So it's just a matter of taste to uh-huh. me. Yeah. 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 Look at it. It, it, that's a, and that's such a great question and a great answer, Brian. It really, it really is because um, I um, have become more of a risk taker as I've, as I've gotten older. I mean, I've been doing comedy for 20 years in some way, shape, or form, and I started out in stand-up and then moved into sketch and to improv, and it made me a better stand-up comedian. And when I'm speaking to a business audience, Brian's right, I am more risk-averse. I just am. Um, however, when I'm on a stand-up stage, I, I live by the rule, you're in, you're in my world, this is a stand-up stage, if you don't like certain things, then don't come to a comedy club, because that's, that's the rules are different, it's a different stage. And what I have noticed is that as I've said more things, and maybe because I'm a woman, and my lens is different, and I think I love being able to say things that people don't expect me to say. 
you know, mm -hmm. and I've got some jokes in there, like, you know, and some of them are, you know, total exaggeration, but the hyperbole of, you know, uh, a crazy harried mom that, you know, um, you know, you wouldn't expect her to, you know, talk about her kids in a certain way or her husband in a certain way or, you know, what if there was a chief executive mom, which I wrote a whole bit for in my thing, you know, would it cut down on corporate mm -hmm. BS? And I, mm -hmm. I think I like saying the things that people look at me and they think, oh, she's, yo, know, she looks like a nice lady from the PTA. And then I walk up on stage and I'm like, boom. And I kind of like right. that shock. But what I also find is that um, people will come up to me afterwards and say, I really liked your bit. I related to it. And also um, what you said was true. But when I make the audience feel convicted, here's the key. I include myself and I say we. Mm -hmm. Here's the dirty little mm -hmm. secret. Yeah. I'm guilty too. That and that way the audience right. doesn't feel lectured. They're going, wow, she's really self-revelatory, and she's including herself in that we. And you so, can go too far, too. I've gone yeah. way too far with self-deprecation where to yeah. get to the point where people start going, aw, you know. You know, <laughs> yeah, you don't the that. audience, <laughs> you've gone too far. Yeah. Uh, you can, but if, you, but if you're not a victim and you're owning it, I think yeah. there's a different attitude. And if you're just saying, this is the way it is, yeah, and I think it's all in how you you own it. Well, and, I wrote a joke yeah. for that. Like when when they go ah, I say, I have a joke uh, that responds to that to call them out on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. anyway, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. I mean, what we're really talking about in a lot of ways is kind of staying one step ahead of our audiences, and you know, breaking expectations and setting up expectations yeah. and breaking them, and how that yes. really works. You know, I think that's something that brands just cannot do. They just don't do it no. well. Is like how do you break expectations because you invest so much in expectation setting. Um, you know, there has been some interesting stuff about where, you know, brands do outrageously, uncharacteristically kind things for random customers yeah. and tell those stories. And that's sort of breaking expectations of what a company should do. But yeah, you don't have too many brands where you're like, wow, this person, this this, this is a, kind of like a person who keeps me on edge in interesting ways, you know. Yeah. And, you know, can't be every brand, but it's an interesting thought about uh, if you don't break expectations, it's hard to get noticed. And it's it, hard to keep people's attention. Mm -hmm. it, that it is, and it's a good point. And the interesting part you got me thinking about is that I think that's one of the things that um, comedy has taught me is that I think if you know yourself well and you're able to call attention to something and own it, the audience is very forgiving. The audience is incredibly yeah. forgiving. And brands, what I think brands can learn from that is that if you've got a really solid reputation and you make a screw up, you can poke fun at yourself because knowing that you're secure as a brand because, A, you do have a good reputation. You do care. Oops, I screwed up. Let's laugh at myself, you know, if I'm a brand. And they can get away with it because they take the audience along them, you know, along that journey with them. And I think, I think brands have a lot more wiggle room than they think they do. And imperfection yeah, well, so is, is human. So... Yeah, and, and imperfection at that level is often a sign of high competence in that, like exactly. an airline, for instance, that pokes fun at, we, we forgot the peanuts on this flight from Las Vegas, free peanuts to anyone who's on the flight, and then you're, you know, like something silly and funny, like silly, that they're yeah. themselves. That's funny, that's funny if not everyone says, just another time, I didn't get my peanuts. But if it's like, yeah. well, the implication is that we almost always get the peanuts, right? If yeah. it's a situation where it just triggers all these other bad memories for people, it totally doesn't work. Then so it does ways work. that kind of imperfection, yeah. like, the imperfection really does, in a way, if you just pull it off well, it indicates high levels of, of competence, and that's a kind of a nice counterintuitive, actually, thing reason to, to show a little bit of imperfection. Uh, well, right. absolutely, absolutely. I mean, with the BP parody uh, tw tweets that were going out, there's no way BP could have been, oops, we spilled in the Gulf, ha, ha, ha. You know? yeah. <laughs> that would not have worked. That would not have worked. Yeah. But, but you could see how there were parody tweets going up because other people could. Other people could do that. And so you're right. It depends on the magnitude of the uh, you know, your confidence and the magnitude of what has happened, what the screw-up actually was. Yeah. 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 Well, that's certainly true. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Well, I'm excited. I can't wait. I already can't wait to read your books. So there, there you go. <laughs> a mystery book. Well, and thanks. Whatever. And thanks for letting me uh, interrogate you guys a little bit. Oh, oh yeah. This is two way. We love it. Pleasure. We love it. Thank you, Jonah. Yep. And where and where can people? Um, you want to give your URL and maybe your Twitter handle where people can find out more about you? Sure. Um, on Twitter, I'm at Jonah Sachs, and um, you can look me up at freerange.com, which is my company, and. Uh, yeah, I'll uh, let you guys know when the book's ready. And, it's, really and awesome. the book that is out is uh, winning the uh, Story Wars. Jonah Sachs, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Jonah. Thanks, guys. Brian, thank bye. you. Yeah, bye. -bye. bye.